How many of y'all are disappointed that's the last time we get to watch that uh, bumper? Yeah, I know. Hey, next week I think we've got another one in store. But how many of y'all can quote Jeremiah 13, 1 now? Go and buy a linen belt. All right, that's good. That's good. We've accomplished something in this series. That's all we wanted. Um, no, the, the vision of this church is uh, beyond. That's the, the clear vision we have right now. We have four goals that this church is going after right now. And we think that if you pursue these goals with us, that your life will be transformed, that you'll be able to, to see through some and anticipate God moving, even if it's a little muddy right now. And so uh, we're going through a series right now that I think is key to this, this vision that we have. By the way, if you want to know more about this vision, you can go out to that table and you can get a little booklet and read about it. But it's key that we make all of our goals God goals and that we have a faith that's tied to what God wants for our life. And so when it comes to the scriptures, I thought we really need to investigate how we can pursue our faith in the context of the Bible, in the context of what God has given to us. But what I know is that this is a challenging, challenging thing for some of us. And so this series, let me recap it a little bit. What we've done is the first week we talked about how we got the Bible. The second week, we talked about why you need to read your Bible. Last week, we talked about how you study the Bible when it comes to difficult things. But today, I want to do something a little different to close us out. I want to give you permission to read your Bible. In fact, I want to give you permission to really pursue and dive in. And some of you are like... I don't need your permission, old man, or I don't need your permission to read my Bible. But here's what I know, is that some of us, when it comes to this book, we get a little, but we don't really push through and really trust this words, trust these words the way that God intends for us to, to trust these words. And I'll listen to our, our uh, um, foundational verse that we've been going through, and that is Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. These are the words of Jesus. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall. And everyone who hears these, uh, because it had been founded on the rocks, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the flood came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, Jesus calls us to a simple faith, a trusting faith, to obey these words, to hear these words, and to obey these words. But sometimes we read these words and we say, well, storms are going to come, floods are going to come, things are going to happen. In fact, when I was listening to uh, the song that we were singing, Oceans, and Joey read that scripture, and Jesus step, or Peter steps out of the boat, and he sees Jesus, and it, and it was a simple faith, I'm going to do what Jesus says. But then what happened? The storm came, and he began to sink, and he doubts, and Jesus asked him, why did you doubt? And he even says, he's, he, or he says, why did you doubt little faith? And I'm the type of guy that... I would be because there's a storm and I'm walking on water. Why did I doubt? That's a crazy question. And in fact, it's, it's one of the things that happens is when we try to follow God's words, eventually a storm is going to come. Eventually something's going to happen and it's going to make your faith complex. And so what happens in this whole message is going to give you permission to have a simple faith when things get complex. I, I, I'm, so I'm glad that we've got students in here. I'm glad that uh, some of you might be uh, new in your faith and you've never heard a message like this. And I've been waiting a while to preach this message because we all start off with this simple faith and, and then something happens and we get complex and then we can never get back to simplicity. Let me give you uh, uh, an example of this in my own life. One of my favorite things in life used to be a McDonald's number two, okay? Okay. McDonald's number two was a simple joy in my life. I would order a number two. It's a McDonald's cheeseburger. You got two of them. I would order two sides of uh, sweet and sour sauce. I would open those, and then I would get a burger in each hand, and I would dip it in, and then I could just go at it. Because if you can have a slow jam, you ever have a slow jam that you just, this is what relaxes me? That was my slow jam. Was a no, uh, uh, that's what it was. It was, Mike. It's just the way it was. I, I could find comfort whenever I, whenever I needed. What are we going to eat? For me, I could just go get a number two at McDonald's. And then I saw this movie, this documentary called Super Size Me. How many of you have seen this documentary? How many of you have seen the documentary and still love McDonald's? 
It's only a few of us in here. Let me show. And I don't. I'm, I'm actually out. I can't. I watched this documentary. It's about a guy who eats McDonald's every day for every meal for like 30 days. I don't know. If, and, and, and he shows you, he talks about pink slime and what they put in their burgers. And it's just one of those things that before it was so simple to love McDonald's. And then I watched it and complexity came over my life. And now that I'm on this side of complexity, I can't get back to that simple love of McDonald's. I can't just say, oh, let's just go to McDonald's and eat some burgers. I can't get back there. I can't enjoy it. You could tell me about how McDonald's has totally changed their image. They're totally different. But because I experienced complexity, because I had this new knowledge introduced, I can never go back and just enjoy it. It's just, it's ruined for me. And that's exactly what happened to some of us in our faith. We started off with a childlike faith. In fact, maybe uh, you might be one like me. I can't even remember a time where I didn't believe that God exists. I always at least believed he existed. And when I would read the Bible um, as a child, I would read things like, I will never leave you or forsake you. And you can trust. I would read the Christmas story and I'd be like, wow, I wish I could have been there. But then as life goes on, things get complex. And, And... Sometimes I just long for those simple days, those simple days of faith. But now I've been through so much complexity in life that I can't just go back to my simple faith. I can't just read the Bible the way that I wish I could read the Bible. Now, for me, uh, this happens quite a bit because I'm constantly reading stuff that challenges my faith. Uh, A few uh, years ago, I read a book by Sam Harris, who's an atheist, and he wrote a book called The End of Faith. And I read this book where he basically spends uh, 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 several passages dismantling the virgin birth, that that never happened, it never could have happened, and that the Bible actually doesn't even say it happens. And he goes through the Greek, he goes through how it was a mistranslation. And I will tell you, I read this, and I wrestled, and I wrestled, and I would come up and preach, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, man... I'm up here preaching in faith because I've got so much doubt right now in these, uh, these things I'm, I'm reading and, and wrestling with. And it was a challenge for me. But what I want to do for us today is I want to give you permission to do what I did in that time. And almost any time, my, my faith is challenged. I was able to hold on to my faith, preach with truth, with, with, with my full heart while I was wrestling with doubt. I was able to push through complexity and find simplicity on, this, uh, on that side of complexity, not just over here. And so I've noticed that when I talk to people about their faith, most people, especially about the Bible, that most of us do not push through when our life gets complex, when our faith is challenged. We, be, we, we, we can't push through the complexity of life And find that simple faith again. And so, we do different things. And you have options whenever life gets challenging. Because it's hard to have a simple faith when you have adult problems. When you have an adult perspective. So, some of us, when life gets complex, we we abandon our faith. That's the response that some of us have. I know many people who grew up in the church, and then life got complex. It may have been an experience. It may have been a, uh, that college professor that just totally you know, said something that you were like, how do I reconcile this? And so for some of us, when life gets complex, we abandon faith. Some of us, when life gets complex, we just blindly follow this is the other side of that. Some of you, uh, you, you're the type of people that whenever you hear religion come up and it starts going into an area that you don't like to talk about because you make it, make it um, in your mind, it makes you feel as if, well, if that, that can't be true. If that were true, my whole faith crumbles. And so some of us, whenever uh, we start talking about something that makes us uncomfortable about the Bible or about our faith, we, we just say, you know what? I just believe. I just believe and, and I'm just going to, to follow because I'm not, I can't risk going through to that side. I can't risk that that's true. Now, there's a danger in abandoning your faith. I mean, what, what if the Bible's true and eternity awaits? That's a big danger, but that's a risk. But there's also a danger in blindly following. You could actually miss God's truth if all you're going to do is decide not 
to pursue his truth. If there are some things that are off limits, there are some questions I can't ask. There are some doubts I can have and, and that I just will never be reconciled. And so some of us, what we do is we get in the midst of complexity and we just kind of hold on in the storm and we lean out. And this is what that looks like. This is when you'll listen, you'll have a conversation with somebody and they'll say something about the Bible. You can't really believe the Bible. Or they'll say something about, you know, what God doesn't, can't really exist. And you'll listen to them. You'll tolerate it. But in your mind, you're not listening. You're not, and you, you, you'll never go down that path of, of it listening to what they're saying. I can't really go this way because what if it's true? And that's what you have in the back of your mind. And so you stunt your growth because you won't listen to the other side. Because there's, there's something at risk for some of you. you. The reason you've never fully become a Christian is because you just you get there and you're like, you know what? I've got too much doubt. And, I, and I'm not going to go. I, so you kind of lean out. But what I want to give you permission to do today is when life gets complex or when your faith begins to get more complex and you lose that simple faith that God is always there for me. Or that God has these promises that he's going to bless me. And God has this love for me and I'm his child. And you have these things. But life gets complex. And you're tempted to say, well, maybe all that was, was wrong. This entire message, I hope, will, will give you permission to lean in during those times of doubt. During those questions. I think that's my son's high blood sugar. It is. Let me turn that off. No, he's good. He's, he's a big boy. It's my son's birthday today, by the way. He's 14 today. So anyway, yeah. In fact, I'm just going to uh, set that aside. Sorry. Y'all like, why is he beeping? All right. So uh, he's perfectly fine. He's a big boy. So some of us. So here's what we're going to do today. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to know. I, I don't know if you've ever heard a message like this, that when you have questions, you have doubts and your faith is tested, that you can Lean in to your faith. And this is what this means. This means you have permission to, to be in parts of your life where you hear something that challenges your faith. Maybe you go off to college. Maybe you go to work and you're sitting by your, your coworker who doesn't believe what you believe. And they're saying things to you. You have permission in that moment to think, you know what? I'm going to listen and pursue truth while holding on to my faith. In fact, I'm going to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to pursue truth and I'm going to find out and, and not abandon my faith in the process. You have the, the, the right to push through complexity and go back and try to find that simple faith that you have, but you'll never get there if you don't, if you don't push through, if you don't lean in and say, I know that there are going to be questions I can't answer. I know that things are going to happen that are going to make this difficult. But you have permission to lean in to the complexities of your faith. And so I'm going to give you four areas today that I want to wrap this up that I, I want you to have permission because we've trained you. You know how to read the Bible. You know why you should read the Bible. You know that all these things, it's inerrant. It's, it's inspired by God. We have these things, but it's hard to, to just believe those things in life. So the first place that I want to give you permission to lean in is when you face adult problems. Because, again, we're called to have a simple childlike faith. And so you hear things like, God will never abandon you. But for some of us, for some of us in here, we, 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 we believe that as a child. We believe that when we become a Christian, God will never abandon me. God's going to bless me. Some of us believe things like God will forgive all my sins. And if I become a Christian, I'll start sinning less and less. And there will be a time when I won't sin. And I'll be like everyone else at church who seems to not sin at all, right? The person next to you, they don't sin. It's just you, right? Yeah. So complexity happens. Complexity happens. Maybe uh, the, the life just happens to you and it changes those promises that you used to hold on to. So, so um, you're still struggling and you've been a Christian now for 20 years. You're still struggling with those sins and you're not, it doesn't seem like you're getting any better. Well, all of a sudden, is God really making me new? Am I really a new person? Is, is the Holy Spirit really working on me? Because the Bible said, but is that really? And it's a little more complex. Or I'm a child of God. God will never leave me or abandon me, but... Why did I lose that person I loved? Why did my marriage break up? Why did these things happen to me? Why, 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 am I, why did I lose my job? Why did I go through these things if God was never going to abandon me? Because it sure felt like he abandoned me. Why did I go through that? And so what happens to some of us is we go through complexity and we get to this point where, you know what, it's not all true. 
you know, it's, some of it's true, but it's not all true. And that's why when I was growing up, I would read like the book of Job, okay? I would read the book of Job one way. The book of Job, if you read the book of Job, the first way as on this side of complexity, it seems like a simple book. Job starts off and he has a lot of sheep, he has a lot of goats, he has a lot of kids, he has a lot of money, he has everything he wants. But you know what? God allows Satan to take all of that from him. And so he loses all his sheep, he loses all his goats, he loses all his money, he loses his houses, his building, his business, everything he's built. He even loses his family, his kids die. And then he wrestles with God all this. But you know what happened at the end of the book? God gives him more children, God gives him more stuff. And I thought, oh, what a simple ending. God restored everything he lost. And then I began to, 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 to grow up a little bit and I realized, wait a second, you can't replace children. <laughs> now I could probably replace a goat, I don't know, I've never owned one, but... If I lose a child, giving me another child isn't replacing that child. And all of a sudden, I begin to see, wait a second. If I lean in to the challenges I face face in life, I begin to see the Bible is more complex than I thought it was too. It speaks to that. In fact, if you read the book of Job after losing everything you've had, you see a man who had it all. He was a self-made man, made his biz- millions. He, 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 he was the richest man in his area. He lost everything, and he didn't lose it because of anything he did. It was unfairly taken from him, I would argue. He got sick, and his wife and his friends all began to ridicule him, saying he was the cause of it. And the only thing you know that he wants, the only thing that Job wants is to stand before God and to plead his case. And he just wants to give God a piece of his mind. And so he even says to his friends, listen, I know that someday my Redeemer lives and someday I'm going to stand before him. And we all sing that like, yeah, my, he's going to redeem. But Job isn't saying it like that. Job is saying, someday I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I'm going to tell him what I think. And you know what happens? He spills all over everything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my notes are gone, by the way. So where are I? No, I'm just kidding. So here's what happens in the story. Job gets to stand before God because he's lost everything. He doesn't think it's fair. And he starts to give God a piece of his mind. And then all of a sudden, God reveals just a glimpse of who he is, of the power and authority. And and basically, Job's response is, and Job even says, I put my, my hand over my mouth and I stopped speaking. And God looks at Job and he says, okay, you've said your piece. Let me tell you what I think. And then he says, where were you when I created this world, when I, when I put the foundations of the earth in place? Where, how, many, how many goats did you feed on the, on the hills this morning? How did, you, how did you like it when I pulled across the earth, the oceans across the earth? Where were you when I did that? Who do you think you are, Job? To come to me and tell me how I've wronged you. When I, when I have been holding this universe together. And Job's response after losing everything and the complexity of life. All of a sudden his life got real simple. And he found simplicity on the other side of complexity. And he found it because he saw a taste of how big and powerful God was. And it wasn't about him getting his stuff back. It was the fact that he saw for a second the, the glory and the power of his creator. And he was never the same. And it didn't matter because all of a sudden he had a new perspective on who God was and how powerful his creator was. And I'm telling you, if you push through when your life is struggling and you think it doesn't speak to you, read Hebrews 11, you know, about the, the saints that were sawed in half and they didn't recant what they believed. And the writer of Hebrews says they didn't get what was promised to them. They didn't get all the stuff they thought they were going to get in this life but they will. The Bible speaks to complexity in our lives. And I know you've been through pain, and I know you've been through things that that make you want to doubt it, but I want to say it doesn't mean you have to abandon. It just means you have to push through that complexity. And I promise you, it'll look different than what you thought it was going to look. But life on this side, when you hear the words of Jesus saying, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, It means something different when you've actually been weary and burdened. Push through when life gets complex. The next place I want to give you permission to push through in your faith is when it comes to scientific discoveries. Now, this might be a little out of the way, but when you're challenged by science, one of the things that I've noticed more and more is that I talk to Christians 
who are people who won't become Christians, and this is what they say. I'm not a Christian. I believe in science. And I find that to be a place I don't ever want um, us to be at as Christians to say we're either science or we're Christians. It's one of the two. Did you know, do you know what science means? It means knowledge, right? So we never want to be in a place where, well, I'm either a Christian or I know stuff, okay? We don't ever want to be in that place, okay? But here's the truth. We live in a time right now where scientific discovery happens all the time, all the time. They just found new planets that they say Earth could, could, could be Earth-like, which I don't know what that means. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's all the time. This was like last week. They're always finding new discoveries. And one of the things that happens a lot and th- th- is that Christians will come to a place where we say, you know what? I just believe that this is how, how, this is what the Bible says. This is what God says. And so we won't even allow for this. Now, a few years ago, I got to go to Ethiopia. And when I was in Ethiopia, I ate at a restaurant called Lucy's, okay? Anybody have an idea why it was called Lucy's in Ethiopia? Because there's a fossil in Ethiopia called Lucy. That's right. Some of you know, huh? And, and you might be like me. I remember in social studies and history class that there was these nine millimeter films. And the only time we would watch nine millimeter films, I'm not that old, but they still had some of these. And so Louis Leakey, Dr. Louis Leakey, I remember we would watch him walking through these hills and finding, showing us how he found these bones. And when I was there, I was talking to an Ethiopian Christian. He was a Christian. And he was so proud of this museum. Ethiopia is the birthplace of life. These fossils are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years old. And I remember when one of the the guests that were eating at the restaurant said, what do you think about the Bible, though, only saying that the world is only 6,000 years old? How could could it be 100,000 if the the Bible tells us it's only 6,000 years old? I remember the confusion that set in on his face when he's like, what are you talking about? It's the scientists are pretty clear. It's six, it's more, it's, it's like hundreds of thousands of years old. How could you, and the, the puzzle that was on his face. I, I hear this more and more that this, I can't, I can't even listen to the argument. And so I want to challenge you a little bit to be able to, to know in the in complexity of science, you can lean in. You don't have to just tune out because you're a Christian. You can lean in. And I want to give you a, a couple of things to chew on that might help you push through. The first one is this. There's a theologian, R.C. Sproul. He's still alive. And he, uh, he, he was talking to his seminary students. And one of the things he said to his seminary students, who are all conservative, they're going to be pastors someday and stuff. And, and he said to them, how many of you believe 100% in the revelation of God in the Holy Scripture? How many of you 100% believe in the revelation of God through his Holy Scriptures? And 100%, everyone in the class raised their hand. And then he said... Now, how many of you believe 100% in the revelation of God through natural science? And he said, not one person raised their hand. And so he asked the question again, how many of you believe in the revelation of God, 100% in the natural sciences? Not one raised their hands. And the the thing that he then challenged, he says, listen, listen. It's the revelation of God Either way. And it's the same God giving the revelation. But why is it that you'll accept one and not the other? And he left that question open-ended. And I want to tell you, there are some things that you have closed the door on in science that the Bible does not speak to. Okay? The Bible does not tell us how old the earth is. I don't care who you are. In fact, for the first 1,600 years, no one thought the Bible or that the world was only 6,000 years old. That's only happened in the last 400 years that somebody came up with that theory. Now, that's not saying it's a wrong theory. I'm just saying you need to understand. I want you to your perspective. And here's something I hope challenges you. How many of you believe in a heliocentric view of the solar system? In other words, how many of you believe that the sun is the center of our solar system? This is not rhetorical. You all got to answer your hands. Don't just sit there and look at me. How many of you believe that right now the sun is in the center of our solar system? You've all been through history. I mean, through science. You know this, okay? How many of you believe the sun is there and we've got all these planets? Some would say nine planets. Some some have kicked Pluto out, I know. But they're all revolving around the sun. How many of y'all believe that? Now, listen to me. If you were alive a few hundred years ago, 
every theologian would have called you a heretic. And in fact, Martin Luther, who's probably the most influential man that, that in all of uh, Christian history, on the, at least for evangelicals, for Protestants, he started the Protestants. He wrote a letter to a man named Copernicus, who had just written a book saying this crazy theory that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the solar system. Because before this, everyone believed that the earth was the center of the, not just the solar system, but the, the, the universe because God had created the earth special. And so how could you realize all the implications of this? And so he wrote a letter chastising Copernicus. And John Calvin and, and many other theologians called him a heretic because he would put this crazy, arrogant theory. You know what, John, you know what uh, Martin Luther's reasoning for not believing that the sun could be the center of the universe? Joshua 10, chapter thir or verse 13. Joshua 10, 13. You see, Joshua's in a battle, and he writes this uh, account of the book. And in the battle, what he says is, it's going to be on the screen in just a second, I think. Uh, he says, sun stand still. Okay? And, and, and it says that the sun stood still and the moon stopped. And so, from Martin Luther's perspective, listen, the Bible tells us that the sun stopped. Why would the sun stop? Because it was revolving around the earth. Obviously, the earth is the center of... And that was his proof that this was a heretical idea. You cannot believe that the earth is, a, that the earth is revolving around the sun. That's crazy. That means you're not a Christian. That's how far Martin Luther took this. But yet, no one in here is bothered by the fact that you have just openly admitted you believe... That in the eyes of the greatest theologian ever, you're a heretic. Hey, congratulations, okay? <laughs> this is my point. First of all, this is not a, a core belief of the Bible. You can believe either side. And I'm not even telling you which side to believe. But I want to give you permission to say there are some times when God reveals himself so awesomely in, in the world, in the natural world, that sometimes that can speak to us, truth as well. You don't have to fear truth. And I hate the idea that a Christian would fear truth. But you have permission to work through it. You have permission to have these doubts. You have permission to say, I don't know. I don't know what this means. I don't know what this means. While you push through and find your simple faith again. You have permission to work this out. Now, I don't know why I have to give you permission, but I do because some of us will stand in our faith and say, you can't believe this or can't. But I'm telling you, I've learned more about the grandness and the, the awesomeness of God by looking at astronomy and seeing how big God's got to be to see a universe this big. But I've also seen how awesome he must be because I've started reading, and this is going to make me sound smarter than I am. I've started reading quantum uh, theory, and it's fascinating how, how small God has to be. It blows my mind more than the bigness of God. It's the smallness of God in this, and how, how orderly some of these things are and how disorderly some of these things are. But it doesn't have to speak to us because we understand when Joshua says the sun stood still, he was in the middle of a battle. Let me explain this. He was in the middle of a battle. And so what happens is he's winning the battle and the only thing that can stop his victory is for the sun to go down and his enemies to hide in the night. So he prays to God, God, can you make the sun stand still so that I can have daylight, so that I can catch all my enemies and we can end this? And you know what happens? God answers his prayer. And so you know what he does? He writes it down. Hey, remember the time that I prayed that God would stop the sun? And it would have made not a lot of sense back then if he just said, remember that time that I prayed that the earth would actually stop and the moon would stop? And you have to, dis you have to suspend all of physics too because we'd have flown off the earth. Don't worry about that. That would have made no sense back then. So we understand he's writing from his perspective. He's still inspired. It still happened. But from his perspective, he prayed for daylight and he got daylight. He prayed for a miracle and he got a miracle. And so when I pray for a miracle, God can give me a miracle. None of us says you got to throw the Bible out because the sun, Joshua said the sun stood still. Push through. Push through. Hold on to your faith and push through. All right, the next place I want to give you permission to push through is when it comes to, uh, and to lean in, is when it comes to difficulties in the Bible to difficult question, Bible questions, okay? Now, as you read the Bible, as you 
grow as a Christian, you're going to encounter people. You're going to encounter things that are not going to sit well with you. You're going to have some people say, how can you believe the Bible? The Bible has been used to hurt more people than any other book or ever, any other religion. Uh, the Bible has been the most destructive. That's not true, by the way. But people will say that. Now, some people will say things. You know the Bible was used to defend slavery. You know the Bible has been used to defend racism. You know that's true? You know that, uh, in fact, in preparation for this, I read a debate from the 1800s that uh, had slavery proponents Verse, it was a debate versus anti-slavery proponents. And you know that they both used the Bible to defend their views. And they both used good hermeneutics. They actually both used the rules of this is, you know, they didn't step out and out of context or anything. And they both said it. And they both used it. And I will say, just if you want to know where I landed after reading it, I'm anti-slavery, okay? <laughs> but it was interesting. And this is, you got to reconcile this. It was used. And that had to be, do you know that for hundreds of years, People would read the early parts of Genesis and would say, you know what the mark of Cain is? It's dark skin. And in fact, they would use that to say, you should be racist because God has cursed anyone with dark skin. And they would defend that. And we've got to understand that, that, that there are difficult things that have happened in our history. And you've got to wrestle with these things. And you've got to, while you're trying to figure out, how could God say this? How could God let this happen? I'll go, just to let you know how that debate for me ends also. I'm anti-racism, okay? I'm anti, I don't think the mark of Cain. In fact, I think that is a, that is a bad hermeneutic. But listen to me. Sometimes the Bible is hard. And you're able to ask questions. Why would it say this? Why can I, can I really pursue this? Let me give you uh, another example here. I'm just going to put a verse on the screen. Psalms 137, 9. We're going to read this together. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. Now, how many of this is in the Bible, okay? I didn't make this up. How many of you, that sets really well with you? I love, that's, that's my, how many of you, that's your favorite verse? Anyone? Good. That would be odd. How many of you would say, that doesn't set well with me? I don't know. Why, why would the Bible, you realize, somebody can look and say, you realize, how can you believe in the Bible? The Bible's a book of hatred. It tells you that you're going to be blessed if you bash kids against the rocks. That's a scary thought, right? And if it actually, I mean, and it means that, you know, I mean, it says that, okay? So how do we push through this? How do we push through? Some of us will we'll hear this and we'll be like, listen, that's the Old Testament. You, can't, you don't have to read the Old Testament. And, and you've leaned out, right? <laughs> you don't have to, the Old Testament, that's not any. We don't have to leave, read it, okay? But I want to give you permission to push through, okay? So listen, 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 listen. We talked about this last week. It's a psalm, okay? It is a psalm. And let me tell you what's going on in the psalm. Babylon has just exiled all of Jerusalem, which means the Babylonians came in, they took all of the people of Jerusalem, they moved them all out, and they took their, they separated women um, from their children, they separated men from their wives, and, and this man has, or this writer has lost probably everything he wants, had, that he's ever had. He's lost it, it's been taken from him. And, and so he writes a psalm, a psalm, a, and that's a specific genre. He doesn't write a narrative or he doesn't write a set of laws of this is how you should treat a Babylonian if you find him. That's not what he has written. He wrote a psalm. And that psalm expresses what he believes at that moment. That psalm is expressing the pain of someone who's just lost everyone and the enemy, the enemy that it took it from him. In fact, let me read you another, another verse from that psalm. This is what he says at the beginning of it. He says, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? In other words, how can I even worship God when they've taken everything from me? And so you have permission to read a psalm and think, this isn't prescriptive for me, but I can at least sympathize with the soul of a man who's lost everything, and all he wants is for every Babylonian to be dashed against the rocks, even if it means the women and children, so that I never have to see a Babylonian again. You can at least understand that. I kind of liken it to the fact that one of my favorite bands is Creedence Clearwater Revival. Anyone? Now here, let me tell you something. I've never, ever been to Vietnam. Right. Never fought in Vietnam. I've never been to the bayou. Did you know that? Never really sat on a porch with an alligator. I don't know what it's like. But every Creedence song is about one of those two things. Every one of them. But when I listen to it, 
I love hearing them sing against the man who's sending them off to war. And that just something about the being, and I'm not even, I don't even know if I'm anti-war against in the VA. I'm not even in that mindset, but I understand the pain of someone who's being sent off. Or the, just the peace of the bayou. It sounds great. Here's another one. I love 90s grunge, but I've never been to Seattle. I've never been to Seattle. I've never done heroin, okay? But listen, I, I'm, but seriously, listen, but I love the angst. I love the angst of somebody who looks at the world and they hate the way that music sounds right now because it's so polished and it's not really what they're playing. And I love them intentionally playing notes out just so you'll know they were playing it live and they can do whatever they want and they don't have to follow the rules. I love the angst. Let me tell you something else that you don't know. I've never been a black man growing up in Compton. I never have. But I love 80s gangster rap. I've never held a gat sideways and put it to somebody. I've never done that, okay? But let me tell you what. I love, I love listening even through the lyrics. You're like, that's not very pastoral. I love at least hearing the soul of someone who feels oppressed their whole life and everything about their life has told them that, that, that they're going to never make it somewhere and that they're always, everywhere they turn, somebody's against them, even the man, even the police sometimes. I, I can at least understand the soul of somebody who wants in that moment to stand up and say, check yourself before you wreck yourself. I, I know, okay? It's silly. But I understand it's a song. I'm not saying it's right. In fact, I'm saying never hold a gat sideways at an enemy, okay? <laughs> but what I want you to see is you can read this passage and understand the soul and the pain and the anguish without having to say, well, I got to throw the Bible out because it, how could somebody read this? You can push through and there are answers if you'll push through. You have permission to lean. And the last thing I want to talk about is I want to give you permission when somebody challenges the Bible as a whole. Because you're going to hear this a lot. How can you trust a book? How can you trust a book that was written, that wasn't even written, uh, it was hundreds of years after, and everything had changed by then? And you'll hear these things. There are thousands of different manuscripts, and they have errors, and, and they have variants, and they're different. And how can you trust it when you don't even know if what you've got in your hands? Let me just throw some reality. The first time that the Bible is ever given to us, or is ever seen in a codex, in an actual book, bound with the, with the books that we have now is in the year 325, 350 A.D. So there's 300 years where the Bible is not the Bible. It doesn't exist as the Bible. It, it exists. What it really is, it's a book of 66 different. We went over this. But there's a time period before the Bible actually exists as a Bible to where churches didn't have every single bit of the Bible. And here, here's the truth. There are thousands of different manuscripts. Some of them are just partial. There's a part of a book of John, part of a, Paul's letters. Some of them are just parts. And there are thousands of these manuscripts. And some of them are different. Some of them are translated different. And here's something you need to know. Some of these thousands of manuscripts were mistranslated. Some of them, the scribe writing this, he, he, he looked at this copy, and when he got to this one, I don't know if he fell asleep, I don't know if he had too much coffee, I don't know what happened, but what he wrote was not what was, was supposed to be written. That happened. That's the truth. There are some of these manuscripts that came later on that have errors in them. We know they have errors in them. How do you push through that? Let me give you some perspective to push through this, okay? The year 70 A.D., the most historic and horrific thing that has ever happened to the, the, the Jewish nation, to the Hebrew people, occurred in the year 70 A.D., bigger than the Holocaust. In the year 70 A.D., the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. Thousands of people were crucified. Jewish men and women were crucified outside the city of Jerusalem by the Roman Empire, and Rome stormed Jerusalem. They either killed everyone, every Jewish person they could. They, they killed people in the temple. And they scattered. A diaspora occurred. And all the Jewish people had to get out of Jerusalem or be killed. And then some of them even fleed up to a, a mountaintop. And when they were surrounded by Rome, they saw no way out. And so they slit their own throats and they killed themselves. And it was a horrific event that happened in 70 AD. When you read the Bible... You don't see this mentioned at all. 
Do you find that peculiar? That the most horrific and historic event in the Jewish, all of Jewish history occurred right around this time, 40 years after Christ rose from the grave. And it's not mentioned by any of the writers. You don't think that's kind of important that somebody would at least mention, by the way, we're all having to get out of here? Every single non-believing person or non-believing uh, uh, theologian just about tries to date the Bible hundreds of years after it was written or after the events occurred. And the reason is because they don't believe that there's any possibility that a man named Matthew actually saw Jesus rise from the dead and would still write what he wrote. They don't believe there's any way that, that James, the brother of Jesus, really could have hated Jesus his whole life and did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But then something happened to where James is writing a book because he's the pastor of a church because now after the death of his brother, he's come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. His brother is the Savior of the world. And he only believed it after his brother died. But those theologians can't grasp the fact that there's no way this book was written, those letters were written after 70 AD. They had to have been written because none of them mentioned the most historic thing. And in fact, we know the most reliable dating puts every letter of the gospel, every one of the gospels and every one of Paul's letters within one generation, by the year 60, really 65 AD, within 30 years of Jesus dying on a cross and rising from the grave, we know that you have men writing what they saw. This is what I saw. This is what I saw. I saw a man, I walked with this man, and he told me that he could forgive my sins, and then he said he would die on a cross, and then I saw him die, and I saw him raised from the dead. And Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, listen, there are 500 people that saw this happen, and if you don't believe me, go ask them. And isn't it, isn't it interesting if this was written when it seems to have been written, that those people were really there. And if Matthew didn't see this, or if Paul, if you really couldn't go ask someone, somebody would have called him out. And so we try to push it off, or people try to push it off and say it was written hundreds and hundreds of years. But the truth is, these were written within one generation, we know. They were written, these words were written, and then scribes started copying them because they were written on paper. And if you spill water on paper, you know what happens? It doesn't last very long. That's all, a, that was all intentional. So... That's what happened. So they realized these words are going to, they're not going to last. People won't know these words. And so they begin to copy them by hand. And there are thousands of these copies because not just did the early church have a few. They didn't just have the, the originals. They started copying and distributing these letters everywhere. And there were thousands of them. And so in the year 300, 300 in the 300s, they began to compile all these manuscripts. And they began to look at them all. And they began to see some of them. This one's wrong because I've got 900 here that say one thing. And this one is wrong. It's obviously an error. And because there are a thousand, you can actually read which ones are wrong. And they throw them out if they're wrong. And if there are variants and there's two words that mean similar and they're said different, you know what they do? Go buy a study Bible. You will have a whole list of variants. This is what some say. This is what some say. This is what earlier says. Your Bible, it might even say that in the Bible you're reading. This is what this variant says. This is what this says. You can trust the Bible. There, no one's tried to hide what it is. The Bible is reliable. And even in those, that 300 years when there was no Bible, they were passing these letters around. But these letters weren't viewed as Holy Scripture at the time. You know what they were viewed as? The account and testimony of men who had been through the most complex time in their history. And their, everything about what they thought they knew about God had been challenged because they had been kicked out of their homeland. They had been persecuted to where now it was illegal to believe what they believed. And in fact, you had the account of Peter, who was tied with his hands behind his back, his wife by his side. And they, they told Peter, as they carried or took his wife off to kill his wife, all he had to do to save her is to recant that he saw Jesus Christ resurrected. You know what he did? He did not recant and he watched his wife go and be martyred. And then he watched and then he went himself and he was martyred. And we have the account of James who was martyred, the brother of Jesus who didn't believe, who in fact would have gladly accepted, I didn't believe. But exactly, he would have gotten off. But as soon as his brother dies, as soon as Jesus Christ goes to the cross, and then something happens three days later to where his own brother 
claims he saw him raised. The early church read these letters, and all they saw was the account of men who went through complexity. And they were able, on this side of complexity, to find one simple question that changed everything about. Who is Jesus? And that one question for Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, and a host of people, even though they were losing everything and everything they thought they knew about God was being transformed, came down to who is Jesus. And all of them said, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And I believe that he died on a cross for my sins and that he rose again on the third day to prove it. And for 300 years, as the Bible was being formed and put together in a trustworthy, and you can trust these words, but you can also have confidence that God was moving in a way so that in this day now, when we say, can we trust these words of mine? We know that a host of witnesses said, even when it gets complex, they weren't worried about how old the world was when Peter was at, at the end of his life. He was worried about one question that made everything simple. Who's Jesus? And that's what I would ask you today. Maybe you're here and you don't know how to reconcile some of these doubts you have. Let's start where they started. What happened to make these men push through all of their doubts and all of their events in their life? They saw a man down across and raise from the dead. And in that moment, they understood every sin they've ever had has been wiped away because God visited earth and he forgave them of their sins because he loved them. That's where I would challenge you to begin whenever you find that complexity and push through. Maybe today you want to make that decision to follow God. There's a connection card right in front of you. I encourage you, push through and start where they started. We have a God who loved you so much. He came to this earth, died on a cross, rose, proving once and for all. It's not as complex as you think. God's in control, and he loves you. Let's pray. God, I pray that all of us in here can push through even the complexity of this message and maybe my muddled words and find the simplicity of who you are. And God, I pray when we're tempted to say, I, I can't really even go down that road because what if, what if, what if it's not true? What if you're not there? What if, what if all, Lord, I pray you'll give us the faith to push through and to trust that your truth is all truth. We don't have to be fearful because we can, we can pursue truth in the midst of doubt. We can hold on to faith in the midst of doubt. Lord, I pray the Connection Point Church breeds a breed of Christians who is so in love with you, is so strong in our faith that we'll push through any of the complexities life throws at us and we'll find a simple joy of knowing how much you love us on this side of complexity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.